Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming to this uh, panel session. This is a very uh, exciting and timely discussion, I think, in uh, building a uh, semiconductor cluster or an ecosystem of companies here in, in uh, Rochester. Um, clustering in Rochester is not new to us. We are, in fact, the home to the, uh, one of the largest optics, photonics, and imaging clusters in the world, and starting with Kodak and Xerox and evolving. And now what you have is over 100 companies, small, medium, and large, doing all different things in the optics and imaging world, uh, providing the bare glass, making the lenses, machinery that makes the lenses, machinery that measures the lenses, uh, a lot of applications in these things. So uh, we, we kind of know how that works. Underlying that is uh, world-class programs at the Institute of Optics at the University of Rochester and the Center for Imaging Sciences uh, at RIT. So that's kind of how this works. And uh, that's why we have this very uh, distinguished panel uh, here today. Uh, so uh, a semiconductor cluster in Rochester is also um, a very timely. So New York State um, was one of the leaders in the semiconductor industry. Uh, IBM was one of the first companies in the world to start making semiconductors in the late 50s, actually. And uh, at first at uh, Endicott, where they eventually uh, moved that to the Hudson Valley and did their packaging of the semiconductors. So we'll hear a little bit about packaging as well as making the chips and explain that to you in a little bit. So, so that's been around for a long time. And then a couple of decades ago, New York State started very aggressively investing in uh, building a semiconductor industry in upstate New York. And it started with uh, what is now a $20 billion uh, mega complex uh, for Albany nanotechnology, the nanotech complex in Albany. On the, uh, on the SUNY campus. And then um, they brought Semitech up, which is a consortium from Austin, Texas. And then uh, New York State started incentivizing companies. And the first big deal was, uh, it was originally Advanced Micro Devices, which became Global Foundries in, uh, in Malta, New York, just north of Albany. And then continuing to aggressively recruit and incentivize companies, there was uh, Wolf Speed, which is a power semiconductor company in Utica. And then uh, more recently, there's uh, an announcement of an unbelievable $100 billion investment over the next 20 years in Syracuse by Micron. This is the company that makes memories. And then uh, more recently still is a, uh, a, the development, the announcement that uh, Edwards Pumps uh, is locating at the Science Technology Advanced Manufacturing Park in Batavia. And these vacuum pumps uh, are machinery that's required to make the chips. So you're beginning to see same way in, in the clustering of the optics. You have machinery, uh, you have the chip design here. Uh, we'll talk about that, advanced micro devices. You have packaging companies uh, here as well. So we're, we're uh, pretty excited to see this whole thing come together. Uh, and at the same time, a couple of years ago, the United States started investing, uh, well, it recognized that it needed to invest very heavily in the semiconductor industry because semiconductors are as important now as they ever were and central to our lives. And there's things that are driving that, which one of our panelists will talk about. And uh, so re recognizing that and knowing that most of these chips are now made in Asia, the United States launched what's called the CHIPS Act. Uh, and that is a $52 billion program to uh, develop, uh, to reshore uh, semiconductor manufacturing in the U.S. And so you're going to hear from that uh, from our speaker from the federal government as well. So um, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, and we have uh, people from academia, industry, state, federal, and uh, local uh, economic development. So these are five different uh, perspectives on, on uh, building this this capability, and all of these are critical to that success. So first, uh, Dr. Eric Bohannon. Eric is a member of the Circuits Technologies uh, team at uh, Advanced Micro Devices here in Rochester, where he works on integrated voltage regulator technology. A little bit of a mouthful, but uh, Eric can explain that. Prior to joining AMD, Eric worked at Sony Corporation and Synoptics, both in Rochester. He holds over 25 US patents and received his BS, MS, and PhDs from the Rochester Institute of Technology, and he is also an adjunct professor at the University of Rochester and RIT. 
Uh, next to uh, Eric's uh, left is uh, Dr. Carl Hirschman, who is the Micron Professor of Microelectronic Engineering in the Electric and Microelectronic Engineering Department at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Carl received his PhD degree in electrical engineering in 2000 from the University of Rochester and has published over 80 technical papers and has refereed in, uh, in refereed journals and proceedings. He has been teaching courses in semiconductor devices and processes at RIT for over 25 years and is now serving as the director of the microelectronic engineering program. And uh, uh, Carl will tell you about that very unique program we have at uh, at the, uh, at, the, at the RIT. Uh, we do not have on the panel today the representative from the University of Rochester, um, E.B. Friedman, and he was going to talk about the things that are going on at the U of R. Uh, and there's a very large program at the U of R, multidisciplinary from across the campus, a lot of it centered in electrical engineering, but also applications in biomedical engineering and material science and things like that. So we have the two universities really uh, are fertile ground for supporting uh, this technology, both from R&D and, and workforce development. Uh, next, to uh, Carl's left, we have, we're pleased to have Laura Fox O'Sullivan. Laura is the director of the Empire State Development's Finger Lakes Regional Development Council. Prior to joining Empire State Development, Laura served as uh, vice president, um, as the president of Rochester's first food business incubator, the commiss commissary and as Vice President of the Rochester Downtown Development Corporation. Laura holds a Bachelor's in History of Art and Ar Ar Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania and a Master's in Urban and Environmental Planning and Policy from Tufts University. Uh, next online, we have uh, Chris Zeltman. Uh, Chris is the Regional Director of UN United States Senator Charles Schumer's Rochester Finger Lakes Office. Chris directs and manages the Senator's Office's activity within the nine-county Rochester Finger Lakes region and provides federal support and attention to constituents, municipalities, community, and economic organizations in the region. And finally, and last but not least, the man who brings it all together uh, is Matt Hurlbutt. Matt is the President and CEO of Greater Rochester Enterprise. Matt has a responsibility for supporting businesses, business attraction, and expansion in the greater Rochester, New York region. Matt guides business development strategies, organizational resources, and outreach efforts to position Rochester as a destination of choice for business investment. And Matt's got a lot of exciting things to talk about in his work in the semiconductor sector. So now, without further ado, I'd like to uh, have uh, Eric Bohannon come up and uh, talk about his work at AMD. Thank you, Paul. It's great to be here today. And I'd like to begin this presentation and give a little bit of insight on how the semiconductor is viewed in industry at a high level, at least from my perspective. So first, let me give a little bit of my background. Um, I went to RIT, uh, BSMS in 2007 and PhD in 2011. I adjunct at both universities, RIT and the University of Rochester, mainly focused on analog, digital, and mixed signal electronics. And professionally, I've worked at Synaptics, optical fingerprint touch sensors, integrated touch and display electronics. At Sony, I worked on quantum film image sensor electronics and high dynamic range image sensors. More recently, about 14 months ago in February of 2022, we opened a site in Rochester for advanced micro devices. They recruited us to work on a specific technology around integrating um, voltage regulation inside of their at big SOCs, their processors, delivering lots of current efficiently to their processors. Uh, in industry, one of the things people tend to focus on is patents, and I've tried to make an impact there, so um, I've got over 25 granted U.S. patents. So we take a step back, and we can ask ourselves, you know, what, what are some of the key and important drivers in the semiconductor industry today? It's constantly evolving. Um, there's demands everywhere. And what we see driving the industry today is artificial intelligence and machine learning. You're all familiar with ChatGPT. It takes a lot of powerful processing to do that, and a lot of these advanced semiconductors are used to meet that need. The Internet of Things, sensors, wireless technologies, wearables, lots of low-power advanced mixed signal electronics are needed to, to meet that demand and create those products. Wireless communications, 5G, speeding up our Internet another big topic driving industry today. 
What processes do we use? What devices do we use? And how do we get that done? Autonomous vehicles. Most people are aware of the self-driving car uh, boom going on out across the country. Um, specifically, there's a lot of you know, photonic electronics integration there and technologies like LiDAR. And so semiconductors play a big role in that effort as well. Cloud computing. You know, what type of software can we run on the internet without having to run at our actual desk with our laptop? There's a lot of advanced, advanced semiconductors being used to get that done. AMD is playing in that field. And then renewable energy. Um, you have wind turbines. You have solar panels. How do we continue to optimize and integrate that technology? So across the industry today, these are key drivers that are you know, growing this area in ways that we need to think where we can add value. What are some of the challenges? So it's not all, it's not all just, just fun. There's also some challenges going on. So some of these you probably recognize given um, we went through COVID, but you know, it, there's challenges to growth. So supply chain disruptions that could be caused by natural disaster, geopolitical tensions, um, different trade agreements between countries, rising manufacturing costs. Um, equipment gets more expensive as time goes on. You get into these finer geometries. You can be down at three or two nanometer and some of the equipment to work there can be very expensive. So intellectual property protection. Not every country has the same IP protection laws. So it makes it difficult to enforce those from one country to another. And a lot of, a lot of high tech companies in the US are constantly you know, employing people to um, focus on protecting their IP. Talent shortages. Um, there's massive talent shortages in uh, the semiconductor industry. At my previous company, Sony, it was so important that they um, have instituted special, um, I'd say, incentives for, for students and people to go into the semiconductor field in that country. So talent shortages rise from you know, a lot of the experts that are moving on, um, and really a lot of other students are going other paths, computer science, machine learning, these type of things, AI. So it's leaving a bit of a vacuum for semiconductor with, return, with regards to talent shortages. Increasing competition, as you know, um, there's a lot of companies playing in all of these spaces, so you know, they're all competing against one another. If you're not careful, that can drive down uh, costs, reduce revenue, and make it harder for these companies to grow. So those are some of the challenges we face. Okay, what about the parts in the industry that all need to work to make um, something like your phone um, come, to, come together, right? So I came up with at least key, seven key parts. You have your semiconductor manufacturers, right? These manufacturers will design and build a chip. You have your equipment manufacturers. So what's the equipment needed in a foundry to get that chip manufactured? You have ma your material suppliers. So you know, we have to, the basic materials used to build semiconductors. We have the packaging and test companies. So these, are, these companies are gonna take our chips, they're gonna package them in a package, figure out how to test them so that they're reliable, qualified. We have design software companies. Um, some of these chips have billions of transistors on them. It becomes difficult for a single engineer or a small group to assess that technology individually. So there's lots of tools out there that allow us to make such complex chips, often referred to as EDA, right? So it's electronic design automation. We have our foundries. We have GF, right? One knows global foundries here, here in the US. We also have TSMC, right? Very, very well-known foundry. These types of foundries are pushing technologies down to the latest and greatest nodes, all the way down to two nanometers in some cases. Professionally, people are working in that technology to get these chips out. And seven uh, maybe is a less under, well understood, but, but also a very important part of it is fabless IP providers. Not every company that's developing semiconductors manufactures it. Um, they'll just do the design, ship the design out to TSMC, get it packaged, have that shipped to a customer. But they're responsible for kind of understanding that IP, maybe mastering the sensor or system. And their company is structured around delivering those parts to a key, a key customer that could be located around the globe. Okay, next slide. So how does the Rochester um, help and grow the semiconductor industry? So I have four key points here. Uh, one is educate. I think that's more, most important. We have to build people, we have to educate people that are able to contribute and add value in semiconductors, right? So we need the right faculty, the right programs to do that. Collaboration, right? So most of you know all about that. We have to collaborate between industry and academia in a way that helps both parties. We need to incentivize people locally to stay here. Right? How do I convince someone to stay in Rochester versus going to Silicon Valley or Austin, Texas? 
right? What's, what's the right way to do that? We have to incubate, so encouraging people to take their ideas, start a company, and you know, grow that and see if it can be successful. So that, these are four things that I think will help grow the industry in this area. And then last but not least, a plug for AMD in Rochester. We opened a site in February of 2022. Uh, we currently have 35 plus full-time engineers employed, and we're working on various things across the company, power management, high-speed I.O., and compute processors. We have uh, multiple job recs posted now, so if you know anyone that may be interested, feel free to let me know or um, apply. So thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. That was fantastic. A, a great lead in on a, a lot of different topics. Um, and my slides have, I think, more pictures and less words. Uh, so it was a, a good start to get us all kind of calibrated on some things. Um, so I'm uh, Carl Hirschman with uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, I'm the director of our microelectronic engineering uh, degree programs. Uh, and as, as Paul said earlier, I've, I've been with the uh, department for, for many years. Um, our, our program uh, does uh, have a variety of research activities, but uh, when our, our program actually uh, was founded in 82, 1982, so it's over 40 years old now, um, as the, uh, the first accredited um, program in microelectronic engineering, um, and remains specifically the, uh, the only accredited uh, BS program. It's actually accredited as an electrical engineering program, uh, but it has the, uh, the courses and uh, science and engineering uh, that is uh, needed by um, engineers in the semiconductor field. So uh, I'll have a little bit more uh, details on that. We currently have over 1,500 alum that are uh, in all the uh, major semiconductor manufacturing companies. Um, and here's just some representative pictures that we have all in the, uh, <clears throat> the background uh, is our uh, clean room facility uh, that we have at RIT. So if you've not seen it, um, please contact me and we'll arrange for a, a tour and bring your friends. Um, we, like to, we like to show things off. Okay. Um, our degree program is uh, specialized in that it, it contains all the wide variety of the, the multidisciplinary things that you need in order to build chips. Um, so it has the, uh, the, the science and math foundation. Um, it's got the electrical engineering core, but it also has the materials, the chemistry, the physics, the optics, all of those things that are involved in, in semiconductors. Um, I'm used to, to pitching this, of course, to prospective students and parents thereof um, in order to share the opportunities and you know, the, the wide variety of things that, um, that our students need to know. Um, but it is a challenge uh, because it is a specialized program. So the, the tendency is for people to think of it as, as narrow when in fact it's, it's actually quite broad. Um, so that is one of the challenges that we face, um, among some others, in getting students right, excited about this field, get, getting them into uh, these um, specialized degree programs. Okay. One other thing to highlight here is the, uh, the co-op uh, employment opportunities that our students have. And I think that that's really key and important. It's a signature of uh, all of our engineering programs at RIT, um, where the students work with these companies, get this real world experience, working on advanced technology nodes that they're, they're not actually getting a hands-on lab experience at RIT. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful complement to, uh, to what we do offer. Um, in their education, okay? Um, the, uh, the lab is uh, a key component of uh, the experience that our students get. So uh, I've, I've got a, uh, an image kind of landscape view um, of one of our clean room areas, the lithographic process area. And then on the right is a wafer uh, that would, um, you know, be one of the wafers in one of our processing labs where the students from start to finish do some design work fabrication, and then at the end, fingers crossed, do electrical testing and verify that their designs and their devices work, um, work as planned. So it's a, a really unique experience to be able to take that from start to finish. Design CAD work, actually realizing it, building it in silicon, and then, um, and then doing that characterization work. A um, couple details. Uh, one of the instruments on the, uh, the left side in the back there on the uh, lithography bay is uh, an eyeline stepper uh, from ASML. They make the leading edge 
lithography equipment, um, the imaging process in, in making chips. Um, the modern ones today cost literally hundreds of millions of dollars. So these fabs that cost, you know, billions of dollars, a lot of that is the equipment that is needed in order to, to make these things. So that's where a lot of that money goes. Um, the one that we have there um, is actually, you know, very good, still at, at the level at which the industry is using and manufacturing. That was donated to us by Micron. It was in their Boise facility. And that was about 15 years ago. They gave that to RIT. Um, it had significant market value as a used piece of equipment. They do refurb and reselling. Um, so that would have cost us about a million dollars on the used market. And we can't afford that kind of investment um, for our, uh, our programs. We need help from industry partners in order to be able to uh, supply these kinds of uh, capabilities to our lab. So critically important, used every day, um, and it's just an example of the partnerships that are needed between uh, academic programs and, uh, and the companies um, that are in need of our students. Micron also supports a professorship. I'm the, the named Micron professor, and um, that, you know, um, really we, or, raises the awareness of their uh, commitment to, to helping support our degree programs, and the students um, understand that, and they also, a lot of them, um, go on co-op uh, assignments with, with Micron as well as other companies too. So, and I, I'm sure this slide, this picture is probably in a, in a few slideshows that we'll see today. Um, this, this huge investment, I consider Clay a, a suburb of Rochester. Uh, this is where the, uh, the Micron facility is going to be. Um, and uh, our students are certainly excited about this investment, um, and it's going to present, you know, tremendous opportunities. I think the HR folks um, in, in Micron, as well as other semiconductor companies, um, are, they, I think they are hyperventilating when they think of the workforce needs, right? The number of engineers that they are going to need to, to serve these facilities. You've got brand new fabs. You've got TSMC in Phoenix. You've got Intel in Columbus, Ohio and you've got Micron down the uh, throughway, and all of them are $20 billion investments, and they're all gonna need thousands of engineers and technicians and other support um, operations uh, to, to run these plants. Um, so it's, it's um, really eye-opening, and, and um, it's not clear at this point as to how these needs are, are gonna be met, but certainly um, specialized programs and partnerships with industry and government are key. Um, Micron, just this might also be another slide, so I, I don't want to steal some things that are in more detail in other presentations, but this is our, uh, our president, um, along with Chuck Schumer. Our president was uh, gifting a, a plaque to, uh, to Senator Schumer um, in acknowledgement of a, uh, an appropriation that was uh, gifted to RIT um, in order to uh, upgrade our infrastructure to help support our lab. As I mentioned, our facility is, is starting to show its age. Um, the uh, infrastructure is at um, capacity uh, and also is in need of uh, some uh, replacement and upgrades. And this is going to be instrumental in, uh, in helping us um, and, and hopefully uh, be expanding our, our degree programs too in order to um, graduate more students. So we're really uh, excited about this. Um, and just to, just to kind of wrap up here on, on the, uh, the job opportunities, uh, so the CHIPS Act will present thousands of new jobs in the U.S. semiconductor manufacturing, right? And the key word there in there, too, besides semiconductor, is, is manufacturing, right? Making these chips um, and, and uh, having these companies, you know, be sustainable and, and make money. Um, so they're going to be hiring thousands of engineers at, uh, at undergraduate BS and, and master's MS levels. Um, a lot of jobs, uh, right? All, all kinds of engineering disciplines um, are, are needed, uh, but there needs to be some understanding and, and knowledge of, of semiconductors, right? What, what chips are. Um, technicians, uh, there's, there's thousands of jobs that are also going to be needed uh, for two year degree program graduates, um, people to uh, run the uh, processes, uh, troubleshoot, fix equipment, build equipment. Right, all of those are going to need um, the uh, engineering technology programs. Um, people changing careers, you know, mid-career folks are, are going to be looking for opportunities to um, change their skill set 
and uh, take uh, perhaps non-degree certificate programs uh, and then change uh, their career path. Um, I've got research scientists there, of course. We've always been, been good at producing research scientists and, and, and the, uh, the, the patents and, and new technology. Um, they're last on the list because of the, uh, the, the manufacturing um, emphasis here, uh, but there's, there's, the semiconductor industry will be, will be taking them all. So it's, it's just the, uh, the need to, to have them work in these disciplines um, and related fields. So, Okay, that's it for me. Paul, thanks for uh, having me here today, and thank you for doing such a nice overview. I think you just made my job easier in your overview of, of explaining uh, the New York State ecosystem. So he also outed me. I was an art history major, so I'm very fam familiar and comfortable at MAG. Less comfortable talking about semiconductors, but um, we have... Uh, Great uh, experts in Empire State Development and throughout New York State, so everyone's in good hands. Um, so as Paul mentioned, uh, my name is Laura Fox O'Sullivan. I'm the Regional Director for uh, the Finger Lakes Office of Empire State Development. Um, for those who don't know, Empire State Development is the economic development arm of New York State. And as we'll hear throughout everyone's presentations, uh, New York State is really looking to be a key player in onshoring the semiconductor industry. Uh, so, so New York State has several competitive advantages. Uh, we're, we're obviously, we're hearing about the, the great talent pool here. Um, I, what I really want to focus on and emphasize throughout my, my few minutes here is the uh, research and development and the ecosystem that exists here. Um, and, and that wouldn't be possible without um, the energy around the Albany area and also in the Rochester area. Um, We'll also continue to see um, that this ecosystem is growing, and, and I'll be talking about the, um, the New York State's uh, Green Chips Act uh, and the, the Micron Effect, right? We're all gonna talk about the Micron Effect, but um, I love this story that, that Edwards Vacuum, who we've referenced here, is moving to the stamp site, and my understanding is that um, you know, they, they had been you know, doing due diligence on sites, and, and Matt knows this, inside and out, um, but that Edwards had chosen to be at Stamp. It was this perfect location for them based on the physical site and the assets at Stamp, but also they were close, but not too close to a lot of their clients. And so I think we have this opportunity, especially at the Stamp site as we talk about our region. And I, I appreciate the fact that Matt, Chris, and I all have the same region. We're all the same nine counties, so we're really working in lockstep. Um, so when we talk about the Finger Lakes, we're actually talking about the same the same region. Um, but that Edwards, we really landed Edwards in many ways because of this growing ecosystem throughout the region. And as we look at this briefly, um, the the assets that are here, um, and and I will confess that um, a colleague of mine, um, and again, if you're if you're much more in the industry than I am, you, you know her, um, Jen Waters works um, out of our Utica office, um, and so she helped me out with the slides. Of course, her being from Utica, um, the bullseye on this is not in the right place, um, but we'll forgive her that because I appreciate the fact that she helped me with the slides, but you know, we see the assets that are really emanating out of New York State and that Rochester has um, a huge amount of um, the, the, the assets in terms of workforce as well as um, infrastructure for this industry. Uh, shovel ready, I know that we have a, a lot of folks here. Uh, Matt, as the number one cheerleader, really excited about um, New York State's uh, increased uh, focus on shovel ready sites, that if we're gonna be competitive um, with other states in terms of attracting these companies that are looking to take advantage of the Federal CHIPS Act, um, that we need to be ready to go. And so I wanna highlight um, the stamp site. Again, we've all mentioned it. It is located just outside of Batavia in Genesee County, um, and they have two tenants that are in the process of um, constructing their facilities. And again, Edwards is a, a major player in the semiconductor supply chain. And Plug Power is just another great company that we all know about um, and is, is growing uh, in, the, in the region. 
Um, I, I will mention you might hear um, in more technical conversations with New York State that um, Fast New York is a program um, that is um, New York State putting dollars towards uh, shovel-ready sites. Again, um, the way that New York State has traditionally done um, site development is different than many other states, and this is this is again more aggressive, more trying to uh, attract um, the the types of companies that we want locating and onshoring in New York State. I'm not even going to mention it. Everybody already mentioned it. Micron, it's coming. We're so excited. Um, and even from a, um, I, I'm an I'm an urban planner, and so for me, and 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 I'm lucky that um, at Empire State Development we're doing a lot of placemaking work. So we're investing in downtowns and small villages, trying to breathe more life into them. And our small towns and villages, especially those in Wayne County, um, Seneca County, um, Ontario County they're gonna feel the effects of this. They're going to be within that housing population shed for Micron, um, and so, so the ripple effects cannot be um, underestimated for this. Um, so, so one thing I wanna mention here when we talk about the universities, and um, Eric, I wanna call AMD out, that um, uh, I was told by a colleague, and you can, tell me if I'm wrong, but that um, AMD has offices outside of Boston and here as well, right? And the decision to, to come here is a big one, right? It's not necessarily a lot of employees in the Rochester office, but the impact, and that as a gesture, is, is, is really uh, significant. And that um, when talking to one of my colleagues about the decision to locate to Rochester, it was because of the longevity and quality of RIT engineers played a big role in that. So, right, they're outside of Boston, they're, they're calling on MIT for engineers, and RIT uh, was, was really key in them locating here. So thank you for that and for, for coming to Rochester. Uh, but, but again, as everyone's saying, the university system can be underplayed in its uh, importance here. Um, so, so just again, to, to um, focus a little bit more then on the, the New York State role here, um, and, and these are, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna run through this, but if a company is looking to grow here, uh, the, you're, you're always gonna hear about the Excelsior Jobs Program, and, and very simply, it's uh, tax credits to have great paying jobs, high quality jobs, um, and, um, and it, the more a company uh, emphasizes um, green building, um, providing childcare, um, higher quality, higher salary jobs, the more of a tax credit is provided. Uh, and then the, the Green Chips Program. So um, this was developed by uh, Governor Kathy Hochul um, in an effort to, again, really be a leader in onshoring this industry. Um, my understanding, and I know everybody played a role here, is that um, the Micron deal was very much impacted by um, the Green Chips Program. Uh, it was an incentive that, I mean, if you look at the numbers here, are for those very large companies. That's not to say that the state doesn't want to incentivize and attract um, smaller, I say smaller, Edwards um, going to stamp is a $320 million investment in 600 jobs. That's smaller, right, compared to Micron. Um, they wouldn't fall in this green chips program. That doesn't mean that there aren't really excellent incentives. Those Excelsior jobs um, tax credits are, are very significant and a, and a great reason to, to locate here. Um, but again, New York State's very aggressive about wanting to be the center for this critical and growing industry in the U.S. Um, and already the state is making a lot of moves to ensure that the infrastructure, by, by creating shovel-ready sites, and the talent um, is really building to meet that momentum and that need over time. Um, so again, just a little bit more uh, information about the Green Chips uh, project. If you go on to... If you just Google green chips, you're going to come up and find all this information on New York State website. Of course, you can follow up with me for any additional information as well. Um, and then this is a great lead-in for my friend Chris to, to come up and talk about uh, all the, the great collaborations here um, between uh, the state and the 
um, the federal government, and I want to, you know, really emphasize that last bullet point: the fact that we have um, Senator Schumer in our corner um, is going to be uh, pivotal in terms of the New York State um, creating really an ecosystem for the semiconductor industry, and the Federal Chips Act. Our understanding um, will really. Um, respond well to the fact that there, there is this ecosystem growing in New York State. These are not one-off companies choosing to locate in New York State. It's a very um, uh, deliberate move by, by um, the state, local entities, um, and economic development partners. Um, again, just as, as my colleagues are uh, pitching to semiconductor companies, uh, really any manufacturing companies, that come here. Um, uh, these are some of the benefits that uh, will be available in addition to others. Um, something that I'm trying to share as much as possible are the um, three bullet points at the bottom here. Um, I know that Matt is working on a kind of big project right now that um, that this, this uh, notion that as a manufacturer, uh, you qualify for 0% state um, income tax, and that uh, as a manufacturer, also your machinery and equipment um, has no state or local sales tax. That's not something that all companies know about New York State, and so um, as you're talking to potential manufacturers, those are great talking points, um, as well as the, the no state personal property or inventory tax. Um, so that's kind of a boring note to end on, um, but it's it's helping to, um, I think, reframe New York State as a place that wants to be the home to and, and be a leader in um, this industry and uh, wants to ensure that our, our future has um, really high quality paying jobs and we're home to companies that are doing so in a sustainable way. So with that, I turn it over to Chris. Right. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Zeltman. I run Senator Chuck Schumer's local Rochester Finger Lakes office, um, and uh, glad to be here. Paul had asked to talk a little bit about kind of the chips and science origin story, um, how we got to the point where last August um, we had passed the probably largest investment in scientific research and um, semiconductor manufacturing here in the U.S. So. Um, I will start with just maybe talking a little bit about um, my boss's thinking around back in 2019. Um, he's you know, long been concerned with addressing U.S. competitiveness, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, um, both to you know head off sort of uh, disturbing rise of the, the Chinese Communist Party and you know it's kind of brazen tactics of you know. Um, uh, poaching, you know, uh, intellectual property, you know, via cyber operations or technology transfers or uh, other um, uh, policies that were kind of undermining manufacturers, especially a lot of OPI companies that I've met with and we've worked with over many years now. Um, but so that was sort of one concern, but also in terms of you know, what can we do here to reindustrialize the U.S. Um, and really home grow the critical industries that will dominate in the decades to come? Things like AI, machine learning, quantum computing, biotech, semiconductors, you name it. Because we, we know that China's really directed its energies and policies towards beating the U.S. and like-minded countries to dominate in these areas that um, will really uh, um, be what will dominate the 21st century. So. And it's particularly with semiconductors, really the race is as fierce and as high stakes as it, as it can get. Um, you know, we, we wanted to, at the same time, you know, take proactive actions um, to really outcompete China by investing in our nation's critical science and technology generators to reindustrialize the U.S. and solidify U.S. leadership in scientific and technological innovations through increased investments in discovery, creation, commercialization in the technology fields of the future. So that was sort of playing on his, in his mind uh, back in 2019 when he was uh, in the uh, gym at the Senate on his exercise bike, 
uh, burning some calories, probably burning some more calories, chatting with folks. And uh, one of the f people that he was talking with was Senator Todd Young, who's a Republican from Indiana. And they had a good conversation. Senator Young had indicated he was also very interested in these same kind of scientific investments um, that Senator Schumer was really focused in on. And so they agreed to, to work together on legislation to revive America's commitment to science and innovation. And together they drafted the Endless Frontier Act, which was in 2019 there. It was the largest government investment in R&D of new technologies, high-tech manufacturing since the end of the Cold War. And um, they, uh, it became, that bill sort of became the blueprint for the science part of the Chips and Science Act. It was, <laughs> fun footnote was, Endless Frontiers Act. It was named after the report uh, that um, Van Devere Bush presented to President Truman in 1945. Van Devere Bush was the head of the Defense Department R&D during all of World War II. You know, folks that brought us radar and um, uh, all of the, and the Manhattan Project. And at the end of the war in 45, he presented to President Truman this report. It was entitled Science, the Endless Frontier, and really advocated for the creation of the National Science Foundation and a big peacetime investment in science and technology. And so uh, Senator Schumer, um, you know, was really resonated with him. He said, this is what, yeah, we'll name it the endless frontier. The problem was everyone thought it would pertain to, you know, the Wild West and Canastoga wagons and, and all of that. So as you can see the trend, by the, by the end of it, we were pretty blunt, just saying chips and science, right? Trying to be as precise and clear as we can get. Um, so that was 2019. By December 2020, you know, Senator Schumer then joined with uh, Senator Cornyn, Republican from Texas, to begin talking about our nation's chip crisis by pushing to create a new federal chips incentive program as part of that year's National Defense Authorization Act. Um, and then about a month later, that's when Senator Schumer became majority leader and then directed the chairs and the members of all the relevant Senate committees to really start working on drafting an entire legislative package to help with uh, U.S. competition and uh, to create uh, new American jobs and uh, directed them to use the Endless Frontier Act as, as kind of the core of that effort. Um, that then became the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, which is the first time that we had both the CHIPS Fab Incentive Program and the um, uh, science uh, program in it. The big thing with the science side is that it, we're creating a new tech directorate at the NSF. That was like kind of the um, the hallmark, the uh, the um, uh, big part of the Endless Frontier Act, and that's what we've maintained throughout the other iterations of this. You know, and the chips fab incentive is really geared toward addressing that delta between building here in the U.S. versus the lower cost of construction in Asia. Um, so, let's see, by early 2022, the House had passed its version of USICA called the Competes Act. And then last summer, we conferenced the House and the Senate bills together and um, uh, passed the Chips and Science Act that President Biden then signed into law. So this is sort of an overall breakdown of the various investment pieces on the chip side and on the science side. You can kind of see that um, there's on the chip side, the first two really pertain directly to domestic chip fabs like Micron, uh, like Intel in Ohio. Um, there's 11 billion for the NSTC and the National Advanced Packaging Manufacturing Program. Those are two pieces that we also think New York and uh, our Finger Lakes region have a very competitive opportunity to compete for parts of those. Um, those pieces are the R&D components, the efforts to keep ahead for future generations, whatever is to come next, the best new designed, you know, chips for let the professionals uh, 
uh, fill, in, fill in the rest. But that's, that's geared not towards the now, but to make sure that we can stay on the cutting edge. Uh, and we expect Commerce to probably put out some guidance on those, maybe even as soon as next week, on, on um, how they want to start standing those up. And again, on the science side, the real um, uh, big new piece of that is the new tech directorate, the NSF. Uh, there's also funding for the Chips for America Workforce and Education Fund, which I know we talked about as well. Workforce is obviously a huge key piece for that, and there's a lot of investment and dollars available through the legislation to do those activities. Um, uh, so we just launched that with Senator Schumer and 20 plus universities, U of R, RIT, our community colleges, MCC. Um, and then, um, as well as some other investments. So it's been about eight months since we passed the Chips and Science Act. And I'd say we had some really historic investments in that short time. Um, Micron, of course, which we've talked about, it was a really, you know, a great one-two punch, I, I'd say, with Senator Schumer and the Chips Act, and then Governor Hochul with the uh, green chips. Um, it's a great marketing a great message to the world uh, that really, um, you know, America's chip future is going to kind of run through New York. Um, we also have Edwards Vacuum that we've talked about. Senator Schumer in the fall had reached out to Edwards to make a pitch. They at the time had a smaller sales facility in Niagara County, but they're a UK company. Their parent company is in Switzerland. Um, most of the manufacturing, the products are gonna do here, were really only done in Korea, but because of the Chips and Science Act, because they had their customers ready to start, really put shovels in the ground here in the US, they knew they had to be here to service that customer base. And, um, uh, you know, they really see Stamp for kind of the reasons that Laura had talked about, as really physically positioning them between a lot of their customer centers and creating that kind of what we're seeing now is this I-90 corridor, which is really globally on the map, I think, to help attract um, supply, supply chains, fabs, you know, you name it. Um, locally, also Corning, which expanded their Fairport facility here in Monroe County, 139 million investment, 270 jobs, and I think they would tell you that they're looking to keep hiring. Um, they're making components for semiconductor um, equipment and really see a lot of growth potential and opportunities there because of the new investments through the Chips and Science Act, both for not only their operation, but also to expand their customer base and their, their market. Um, same thing uh, I heard from one, one of our CEOs, of one of our local OPI companies, um, and I told him I wouldn't hold him to this to say it publicly, but maybe I will. You know, had said that he told his board when, when Chips and Science passed that, you know, this represented probably $100 million in new revenue over the next decade because they also supply uh, parts and equipment to uh, semiconductor uh, manufacturing. And then going forward, um, you know, the Chips and Science Bill really helped rebalance this asymmetry I was talking about between the U.S. and China in terms of onshoring and in the production of vital technologies that we need that are in everything and will continue to be essential to everything we do. Um, we're still globally competitive in designing of advanced chips, but we're, you know, woefully behind on manufacturing. Only 12% of the world's chips are now made in the U.S. China produced about a quarter, and uh, that, that's going up. So really, without the Chips and Science Act, you know, the projections had been that Asia was projected to control about 83% of the global semiconductor supply uh, by 2030, and the U.S. share would actually decrease to 10%. So we're hoping with the Chips and Science Act we can uh, rebalance that. So in the long run, you know, the legislation will really ease semiconductor supply chain um, concerns increase domestic inventories of chips, lower costs for c consumers. Um, I, it was a fun 
uh, August day when we were at Bob Johnson with the senator talking about uh, chips. The one woman who's right behind the senator had been waiting, I think she said for about nine months to get the, uh, the truck that you see in the background there. Um, but uh, that was the day she, she got it, so she was happy. Um, and then going forward, I think we'll continue to have lots of opportunities to benefit from the investments. Um, the Commerce Department, like I said, and the NSF are now really feverishly standing up a lot of these programs. They are soliciting input, you know, releasing guidance documents. Uh, we see a lot of opportunities to start filling in a lot of our shovel-ready sites along the I-90 corridor. Matt can talk more about what's in the pipeline, you know, and opportunities that we have there. Um, NSF as well is starting to roll out a lot of the funding that they'll have. We've, our region has always done very well in terms of securing NSF grants and funding to really accelerate economic development and commercialization. Last April, Senator Schumer, the picture that's there, had invited the head of the NSF, Dr. Ponchanathan. He said, just call me Ponch, so Ponch. Um, uh, you know, came to Rochester to see firsthand all that we really had and all the possibilities uh, potential that's here uh, that can be supported with this upcoming NSF investment opportunities. We had a great meeting at um, Next Core at the Sibley Building with Ponch to really go through and meet with some of our innovators um, to kind of talk about all that. And then, of course, Chips, for, Chips and Workforce, which we've kind of touched on as well, will be uh, opportunities here in our ecosystem and really, I think, um, you know, will be important for industry as well to have this capacity here for, for training and education. And then, um, as I mentioned, the NSTC and the advanced packaging, I think with our assets at Albany Nano, we've got the uh, TAP packaging facility here in Rochester. You know, we have a lot of components to really um, uh, get uh, involved with both of those as they get stood up. So uh, with that, I appreciate it. Thank you. Good afternoon, Paul. Thanks for uh, having me. I, I will say my presentation is going to be short. They took all my talking points. Um, so, uh, Greater Rochester Enterprise, very quickly, is the uh, region's business attraction and business support organization. Uh, we uh, cover the nine county region, providing companies responding to formal requests for information known as a request uh, an RFI. So, oftentimes, those are 80 to 100 pages of information on demographics, supply chain attributes, uh, the physical sites or facilities that a company needs, um, incentive information, and then uh, talent, uh, not just enrollments at local colleges and universities, but also that supply chain and the, and the uh, graduation data, as well as expansion and uh, attraction information. If you remember anything, the, the real key is, is the, the end there. So we've actually worked with everybody here and many of you that I see in this room it's a very collaborative effort, so uh, in response to requests for information, which is very data intensive, then you meet with corporate organizations and executives and understand what is keeping them up at night. And oftentimes, one of the reasons why we were so busy and had so much success is that the smart people that live in this region, the smart businesses that are here growing, uh, some of them are demonstrated uh, on the panel here today, are really the story of Rochester in this region and, and driving innovation uh, certainly with semiconductor, semiconductor supply chain opportunities, but also some of the recent wins we've seen in the past year. Uh, we've seen success across uh, food and beverage. Um, AMS is another company that's here doing design work, life cycle, site or optics, corning, which was mentioned before. And again, many of them are in these key industry supply chains. So last year we saw $1.2 billion of investment, 3,800 uh, new jobs coming online and 1,400 retained. We talked about Edwards. Edwards, again, is an example of really digging in deep to understand what the company needs uh, as, as far as, yes, the shovel-ready site, their proximity to those customers, and also the connectivity that I think is unique to our region. The way that we work to together, the way that we collaborate with our friends at the University of Rochester, uh, with our corporate friends at AMD, AMS, uh, Sony, uh, Kodak, Xerox, Bausch and Lomb, and others, our friends at the University of, of uh, Rochester, RIT, and outside of the region. Cornell is a strength to us, UB, 
uh, Alfred and others. And that's the story that we really try to tell on that global stage. So we're still engaged with um, what was known as Project Kingfisher Edwards right now as they continue to plan to build that new facility. They will be hiring from our region as well as uh, from the Buffalo area to, to staff that 600 person operation. Uh, they should be breaking ground in the next quarter or two. The design is already moving forward. And again, as you see that investment being made, we have other connection points and stories to tell in the semiconductor realm and in the sem semiconductor supply chain. This might be a little difficult to read, and you will note that uh, you won't recognize any of these names because these are the, the difficulty of what we do every day at Greater Rochester Enterprise is usually we're engaged in, a, um, in an NDA with companies as they uh, seek to make major, sometimes multi-billion dollar investments in a community, and it's a very, very competitive process. So you see before you some semiconductor and uh, semiconductor-related supply chain opportunities. You can see we have several active projects. Tower has been mentioned, um, almost $9 billion of capital investment. Acropolis, one of my favorite names, a $2 billion investment, 700 new jobs. A golden barrel is in that uh, packaging space uh, that Paul mentioned before, about 1,300 jobs, uh, $900 million investment. Stella. Uh, almost $700 million of potential investment, still very active. Discovery, again, is another uh, semiconductor packaging opportunity, almost uh, $600 million of investment, 800 new jobs. And then uh, Project 8, which is about a $400 million investment, 400 net new um, jobs with 110 retained. And that's on that semiconductor side. And then you see Touchstone, Edison, Kryptonite, uh, again, a, a really great name there, $23 million. Uh, uh, with very active uh, in the space. And then Lilly, which is a smaller engineering related opportunity. So we're leveraging the supply chain and we see it, it opportunities in the packaging realm as well as other supply chain companies. And we're working with our partners at the state and with the federal level to promote our region for those investments. You, you will see uh, those wins. Quest was, um, was Corning and Kingfisher again was Edwards, and those are, are coming to the region. Nebula was a, was a loss where they uh, are going to uh, a state in the Midwest for a $500 million investment. Rockstar was actually uh, started off as Micron, which then expanded well beyond that. Uh, Dragonfly was Intel, who ended up in Ohio, and Ajax was, uh, was Samsung, and I think that was pretty well documented where they were considering the stamp site. They ended up going to Texas. And that's, that's sometimes the difficulty in an in a opportunity like that where always prying a company away from, a, from where they're already existing in an operation is one of the most difficult things in the business attraction realm. But honestly, we did have a very good uh, opportunity with all of those opportunities. Uh, the, the key to Micron was really uh, that the 1,400-acre canvas a uh, very large uh, water pipe uh, just in clay, about 500 or 50 million gallons of water a day, which is almost a city. And when you talk about supplying that much water and access to about 200 megawatts to start and almost 500 at full build out when they get to full capacity. So uh, one of the things that we talk about, and Laura mentioned it, is shovel ready sites. Uh, we need more shovel ready sites. We appreciate the investment from Fast New York to help us uh, get sites like Stamp set up as well as a few others that we're investing in in the region for these supply chain opportunities. So oftentimes companies are looking for 50, 100 acres, uh, power, water, and intensive capacities uh, to run these facilities. And then we like to talk about the supply chain uh, that we have here in the region. When you look at uh, over 118 companies, 33,000 of them in employment that can support these types of technologies. You see D3 Engineering that does a lot of design work, Linton, who's expanding here, L3 Harris, Applied Image, and so many more that are in this space that have the capabilities, the technical knowledge uh, to grow themselves as well as support uh, semiconductor and related activity in the region. And then we also talk well beyond, while well, we have our 18 colleges and universities, about uh, 74,000 students, 18,000 graduates a year here in the nine county region, we really extend that talent pipeline across the upstate. And I think you also saw this in some of Laura's uh, slides where she talks about the upstate ecosystem. We try to relay the fact that if upstate New York was its own state, we'd be the 26th largest state in the country. So from Buffalo to Albany in the southern tier, it's something to keep in mind. And that corridor, that I-90, tech corridor where companies like Edwards can supply companies like Intel in Ohio as well as Global Foundries and certainly Micron. We are ideally suited to have those companies build out, leverage our ecosystem here and connect 
to over uh, 400,000 students across upstate and those 79,000 graduates and that STEM enrollment of 50,000 students and over 16,000 graduates. And that's just a sample of the outstanding universities that we have across the upstate on this slide. And we certainly have good connectivity with our local colleges and universities that really help us tell that story, but also uh, connecting beyond that as we have prospects that are in the region. Then the other key part is that technical training. Typically 80% of, of employment at one of a, the fabs or uh, supply chain opportunities is gonna be with a two year degree or industry credential and certainly Monroe Community College is an outstanding uh, training provider and uh, community college in that regard. Also sharing curriculum with Finger Lakes and GCC. So we've got that ecosystem well wrapped and in fact for Edwards, ECC, MCC, GCC are sharing curriculum and they're ramping up now to supply the skill sets that are gonna be needed at, at Edwards facility as they build out at the stamp site. And I think, is that my last slide? Yeah, that's my last slide. So, um, Again, looking forward to having a conversation with you. We are very active, certainly in this supply chain and with semiconductors in general, uh, but also in so many other industries that are really all high tech and leverage, leveraging some of the semiconductor attributes so they can process food and beverage package and so many other key skill sets, certainly in medical device and other technologies. So thank you and uh, looking forward to the conversation. So, Matt, thank you very much, and thank you all for those uh, comments. Matt, you mentioned uh, the food industries here, Ledestri and others. Uh, so we thought we would combine semiconductors and food, so we have a lot of bags of potato chips out there so people to eat. So, All right, we have time for some questions uh, from the audience. Anybody have any questions about what we're trying to do here? Yes, Bill. Yeah, so this might be for uh, Eric or relates to the manufacturing process. And I come to understand a little bit about ASML and the fact that uh, apparently they cannot export their machines to China by some rule by the UN or NATO or something. Where are we, even in New York, or let's just say in the United States, where are we with respect to understanding or going further than the ASML process, which is headquartered and owned by the folks in the Netherlands. More Sorry, I'm a little more on my side. Um, so ASML um, is doing the, the absolute leading edge uh, imaging systems. Um, they've got very little competition at that leading edge, right? With, uh, with the, uh, the EUV systems, that can image uh, down feature sizes, um, which dramatically increase throughput. Um, the alternative is multiple imaging. So you have to image, you have to do perhaps four imaging steps um, with, a, uh, with a Canon system um, or, or an ASML um, you know, standard uh, immersion uh, optical system versus the uh, extreme ultraviolet system that they have where you could do it in, in, one, in one step. Um, a, a, a plant that would have one of those machines would be, you would have one of those machines. That's all you would have, right? Um, or, so the, it would be a big decision as to whether or not you would, you would even have that. Um, so there's not gonna be, um, you know, a, a company that's gonna, um, you know, overtake ASML uh, in, in any foreseeable future in that particular uh, technology in that processing. Um, the other equipment you know, manufacturers and opportunities in, in other areas of semiconductor manufacturing, it's a lot more equal. It's a lot more, you know, distributed among uh, the various companies um, that, that make semiconductor processing equipment. So it's not so weighted over to, you know, one, one manufacturer in that regard. So, Bill, so clarify, I don't know if I answered the question or I'm just talking, but yeah. No, no, that was Of course, the line size is going down as you get shorter in the wavelength. Right. The question is, is, is any of this money that the government is throwing out centered on advancing that technique or not? It's all about the machine. Okay. It's right. not about the graduates. 
it's about the machine that is the heartbeat technology. What really I found a little frustrating, of course, I've lived in Rochester now for a long time, but it, it involves chemistry, it involves optics. Uh, oh, and those are the sort of things that we were very good at here mm -hmm. in upstate New York, right here in Rochester. Mm -hmm. Now, how did this escape? That's a whole thing, that's a whole chapter in the book. You know, but the fact is, it's got the heartbeat of technologies that we know a lot about right mm -hmm. here in Monroe County. And it's over in the so Netherlands. The, the, you know, yeah. So that was frustrating to me, and I was like, we've got to get there because the machine that is what, going to go into the stand, or can, is that one of the ASML $100 million machines? No, no so the, I, um, the Micron facility will probably have one of those EUV systems, Global Foundries. Um, I, they may have one of those systems. I know that there's one um, in the uh, in the SUNY Poly um, research uh, facility there that uh, that companies can access. Um, so I would not consider it uh, something that we lost. Uh, certainly not. So ASML is worldwide, mm -hmm. and they've um, they've got uh, research partners everywhere. Uh, one of our uh, faculty members, uh, Bruce Smith has worked with ASML for years, was one of the pioneers in immersion lithography, which was, you know, um, what got 193 nanometer technology to be able to image, you know, things down to 50 nanometer dimensions. Um, but we've, we've got that next leap. So there, there, there's still um, research scientists working on that, um, doing the, uh, the behind the scenes work. But yeah, it's, it's being made uh, with, with that company that had that infrastructure to be able to, to make one of those systems that takes um, a couple of 747s to deliver one to a company, right? It's, so it's, right, they're amazing. They're, they're crazy. So the, the foundational technology behind EV was actually invented in the United States and mm -hmm. once the Vermont National Lab was funded through the National Security Administration, which was not really interested in chips. They were solving another problem. Uh, so I don't think it's probably quite fair to say that we're not active in that area. It's unfortunate it did not get commercialized in the United States, but uh, we actually have quite a bit of a footprint uh, there in the development of that technology. Thanks, Clayton. Uh, anybody else with questions for any of the panelists? Yes, Sam? Uh, I've been at the Finger Lakes Community College for about three decades. Before that, I have had decade-long background in doctoral and postdoctoral work in nanoscience, nanotechnologies. This is somewhat of a non-technical type of question, and I would direct that to Laura. Um, what I have found over the years that some of the most successful students from our program are people who have had liberal arts background. Mm -hmm. They may have had bachelor's degree in finance, political science, uh, history and so on. And when they come in the program, um, we're able to connect them to businesses within a matter of months while they complete the degree uh, because we have high flex options. I believe that underemployed liberal arts graduates who have good work history around the country who are not, some of them not happy with where they are, they are untapped resource with regards to semiconductor and other high technology uh, workforce. With the community college and other programs, there's a long lag time. With the community college, graduate maybe 25% over three years. And for semiconductor curriculum, it may be even lesser. Semiconductor fabs are in few locations around the country, are also in New York State, far away from other population centers. So we need distributed strategy to get the pipeline uh, feeding them. Mm -hmm. What is your experience and do you think that we can launch a statewide effort to encourage non-technical graduates to transition into high technologies such as semiconductor manufacturing? I think the easy answer is yes. Um, and so, Paul, I was visiting, this is on, right? Um, so, Paul, I was visiting Mosaic, right? I, mm -hmm. I toured around to Shelby mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. And she mentioned that one of your, uh, I, maybe I shouldn't call her a scientist, one of your employees was a liberal arts 
background right out of college, I think maybe from Nazareth or St. John Fisher, and was doing great and loved the work, but had absolutely no background in, in the sciences or in engineering. Um, so I think that there will be anecdotes like that all over. So I think there's your proof point right there, right? That there, those examples exist. Um, I do think a lot of it, um, and I know that Stacy is very geared in on this from GRE, from the marketing side. Um, I know that our um, Empire State Development's marketing team is very much geared towards that. I mean, we're all, it's no secret, right? We have to be um, encouraging people to move here, right? If we have these great jobs, I mean, I think um, at Edwards, the average salary is seventy or eighty thousand dollars a year, um, and this is in Batavia, where that can get you a long way. So I think um, uh, letting letting young people know, letting underemployed people know. I mean, I'm a mother of young children. So many women left the workforce over the last few years um, because of uh, childcare obligations during COVID of getting people back into the workforce and convincing them that manufacturing is not what you think it is, right? It's not working in a steel plant. It's, it's high tech and it's also, you know, the talking points of you're playing a role in, um, I, right, the Senator had said this, the, the greatest public works project, you know, since the Erie Canal for our, for our state of, um, that you can play a role in this. So I, I think it's educational, I think it's, um, it's uh, it's marketing, and I I absolutely agree that I think that there's potential for that because it's one thing to say yes we need to be you know convincing children in the Rochester City School District that they have a future in um, in manufacturing and in engineering that you don't need a four year degree to do it, um, but these jobs I mean, Edwards is hiring this year, so it needs to happen now. So thank you for your for your thoughts on that. Thank you, Laura. Uh, anybody else with questions on the panel? Hold on a second with that. I want to give some other people an opportunity, or I got a couple questions I wanted to pose first, and we'll get back to you in a second. So, uh, Eric, I've got a question. Uh, what kind of starting salaries can uh, graduates expect at the various degree levels, bachelor's up to PhD in the semiconductor industry? Yeah, that's a great question, and I'll kind of answer it two ways. The first way, um, some of you may know some states over the past year to three years have passed pay transparency laws. And so well, when I, when I, what I mean when I say that is you could go to some of these companies, look at the rec online, and see the range of salaries for the listed position. So California and New York are two states that have those laws. And so for the different roles in recs at AMD or other companies out in Silicon Valley, you can go find the role, find the requirements and see the range of pay. Um, in IC design, is it is not uncommon for a graduate student, maybe master's to PhD, to have a starting salary between one hundred twenty-five and one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, and that's a base salary. And on top of that, there's other incentives like employee stock purchase programs, restricted stock units, and bonus. And so those those are very common numbers in the industry. And you know, it's less mysterious today because, like I said, you can. Go online and verify that for yourself in just a few minutes. Thank you. Um, got a question for Carl. Uh, we talked mainly about chip fabrication, the clean rooms where you process the wafers and all the uh, sophisticated lithography tools. But as we know, in order to use a chip, you have to package it first. You have to cut up the uh, wafer into chips and package it. Uh, are, does RIT offer any uh, programs or training on the packaging side? And what kind of disciplines do you have? Do you have to have things other than just electrical engineers to uh, become packaging engineers? Right, so the, the, uh, the packaging, we do have um, a, a degree program within our uh, mechanical engineering technology. Um, they have um, a, a lab, our Center for Electronic Materials and Assembly where uh, they focus on the, uh, the technology uh, in, um, in package and uh, assembly. Um, the uh, differences, some uh, differences in curriculum um, would uh, involve additional courses in, in materials and the mechanical properties, um, which are important for packaging applications. 
These packages undergo terrific amounts of stress, thermal stress, electrical stress, um, so, and, the, and they, they need to last, be robust. Um, so it's, it's, it's certainly a critically important part of, of the, uh, the whole uh, product that's being made, right? The, uh, the chip inside the package. Um, there's uh, also, along with the, uh, the CHIPS Act, are investments that are gonna be made in, in packaging to support that. And that uh, NSTC, I'm involved on one of those um, committees that are um, now going through um, a variety of discussions on establishing the, uh, the needs and, and the role that, uh, that those investments are going to, to play. Um, packaging historically, um, you know, even though chips, so a lot of chips are made overseas, a lot of chips have been continuously made though in the US, but the packaging largely is, uh, is outsourced. So that's done overseas and then, and then the products come back. Um, and there's a big effort now to also onshore uh, a lot of that operation. So some companies are better suited than others um, for that, I think so. Um, but that's, that's certainly gonna uh, have a, uh, uh, an increased importance uh, the, role, the role in uh, packaging and advanced packaging. And certainly for the area too, as Matt had said, a couple of the companies he's working with are in the packaging side of things. So yeah. I think that's good. Uh, uh, Bill, supply, yeah. supply chain shortage, if we're not, in my opinion, if we're not also doing something on the packaging side, we're gonna have a lot of silicon and it's all gonna be sent out overseas and we're not gonna have chips, right? So you gotta you got have the whole thing. Thanks. Uh, Bill, you had another question? Just an observation, uh, maybe a question. I was from RIT. We yeah. have a few more folks here as well. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yep. um, between the two universities, we bring in about $500 million a year in terms of research money. That's a lot of money. For, forget the politics and so forth. This is hard work coming out of the research organizations. So the question for the economic development folks should be, okay, so you guys in the universities are getting $500 million. What are you doing with this in terms of getting it out, you know, in terms of products, startup companies, and so forth, which would help the local economy? I just wanted to make that observation, and, and I'm not including in that number, you know, Cornell, Binghamton, these are huge operations that need to be also the sort of uh, spark, if you will, for innovation locally. Not, you know, govern, you know, not, you know, federal government shooting money in, although that's really nice. But you're already getting 500 million plus right here. So how can you help get that technology transferred into well, um, it's interesting because I was just having a conversation with an individual just before this uh, panel started, and uh, it's uh, uh, somebody actually from um, uh, Rochester that has a company, Ruben Ospitz, sitting right there, and his company is IP.com, and he's enrolling a new program to help universities do exactly that, to help uh, using the, the sort of uh, artificial intelligence that uh, they use to um, help universities uh, enable companies to come in and, and understand what's going on. And so I actually want to introduce Ruben to Laura afterwards because I think that's something that uh, New York State as a whole, uh, NYSTAR, could, could benefit from. But there's definitely things that uh, that we can do more. I mean, the whole purpose of the CATS and the COEs, the CAT program was started some 40 years ago, I think, uh, is to, you know, is to enable that. And we're doing a good job, but now with this new technology, I think we can even do a better job of um, that technology transfer. I don't know if any. Yeah, and, I, and the only other thing I would say is, and I think it relates on the workforce side too, is that we, we do a very good engagement both on the local expansion side when you look at Corning's announcement working with MCC on their optical technician program, which is the only one of its kind, as well as the University of Rochester and their optics program and, and RIT. Uh, so you've got good industry connection when you talk about $500 million, that, that money is in different segments. So you've got the laser lab, which is certainly an asset for us. 
and has spurred a lot of innovation. They were involved in the fusion research on energy, and the, there are other attributes at each of the, the research that's going on at University of Rochester and, and Cornell too, um, and other places at RIT that we're leveraging. It really is company specific, so that's where our focus is really on what's keeping you up at night, what leading edge technology are you trying to get to, and then working with our uh, university partners, what do you have, and do you have a researcher, do you have faculty? I have been in the uh, clean room facility, for example. So, uh, you know, we, t we tour and access those um, operations, and really on a moment's notice, and that's what I meant about the connectivity. So we've literally been driving through the region looking at facilities, listening to the executive that's making the corporate decision, and they say, you know, this, we also do this. And then uh, at a moment's notice, we will stop by our university partners to tour a clean room, to tour a lab, and demonstrate the capabilities here, and that can be the deal maker. We've had Edwards in facilities at U of R, RET, MCC several times now. Um, and again, that connectivity and those proof points help us do our job. So, you know, the, the, the investment is critical, but it's also the ability to connect and leverage it. And that's something that I think we do pretty well. And certainly on the tech transfer side, it's a little different from forming a company and leveraging, getting from uh, pilot scale to commercialization, uh, you know, to the point where you're making money and selling it throughout the world. And I, I think I'll add to another shout out to Senator Schumer and his vision with Endless Frontiers Act. Another component of that that I don't think was talked about was the new Technology Innovation and Partnerships Director at, mm -hmm. at NSF that is specifically targeted to applied research and helping universities uh, move some of this stuff out into the world. There's opportunities just rolling out now, so we're taking a look at those and trying to figure out ways uh, to take advantage of those opportunities. There obviously be uh, merit review based, so you got to compete for them. There's no guarantee they'll they'll come here, but uh, I think it's a pretty exciting time and recognition that the, the need uh, to continue to move those innovations out in the world and grow the local economies. Yeah, I was going to mention, I saw Jim, Jim Sinal in the back, you know, that kind of, the pipeline that, that we have here where, you know, we had the one slide with uh, our NSF director purposely, you know, at NextCore to make that connection between the research dollars that NSF is putting in the community to the output that you're seeing, the commercialization of all that. So we have that pipeline, and yes, we just need to keep, mm -hmm. I think, focus on it and, um, you know, augment a lot of what we have, which is, you know, a, a good network and a good ecosystem. We have time for a couple more questions. Anybody in the back? If you can uh, wait for a microphone, because this is being live streamed. Oh. So one of the, um, uh, shortages, I would say, that we have in our community that I don't think gets a lot of attention is um, kind of a shortage of entrepreneurs. The University of Rochester and RIT have amazing technology patents sitting on shelves waiting for entrepreneurs to come and move them forward. And despite the many programs that we have to incentivize and encourage and train and educate entrepreneurs, it just doesn't seem to have made a big difference in you know, having entrepreneurs around. And so I'm wondering what thoughts um, the local and federal government have about, about, you know, solving this problem of the shortage of entrepreneurs, at least in the upstate New York area. Well, I'll, I'll give you my opinion, is that it's a chicken and egg. And if you ask a venture capitalist, how come you're not investing enough in Rochester, they'll say, there's not any entrepreneurs or ideas coming out of Rochester. And if you ask entrepreneurs, they'll say, there's no venture capital money. I can't start a company here. So th there's a virtuous cycle in Silicon Valley and that it all just converge and every VC wants to be in Silicon Valley and every entrepreneur wants to be in Silicon Valley. And so we have a lot of venture capital here and we do have a lot of entrepreneurs and we're very fortunate to have organizations like NextCore. But your perception, perhaps, you know, is that, well, how come this is not a Boston or how come this is not a Silicon Valley? Why is it only uh, a dozen or so new tech companies a year? Why isn't it hundreds? And it's, it's the chicken and egg problem. And I know the people on this panel and Jim Sinal and uh, a lot of people at the U of R and RIT are working hard to, uh, to move that forward. But it's not easy. It's very difficult to do. Okay, let's see, I did have one more. Um, oh, so Matt, when, um, 
when a company comes to you, and I know there's every company has a different set of needs, mm -hmm. but a company comes to you, typically, what are their top three sort of competition things? How do you, where are you in this particular asset versus other uh, you know, areas? What are, what are the things that uh, they most often look for? Yeah, um, usually the uh, top requirement is a, let's say, 200, 200,000 square foot facility or 100, 100 acres shovel ready with certain power, water, wastewater attributes within th five to uh, three to five miles of a highway or an interstate, and then it gets into the talent. So uh, demonstrating not just uh, typical demographics, but the technical talent, understanding in some cases, especially with uh, high-tech companies, software-related, not only um, the number, the uh, companies in the region, how many people they have working for them, but what the skill sets are in those companies. So it's a lot more, they, they do what's called a bent, uh, desktop analysis, where they kind of know the averages for your community. They typically call us and say, you're in the, in the final 10 or 20 uh, facilities, but you need to prove to me that you've got the current talent, uh, you've got the physical assets that we need or that or you can get there in our timeline and then uh, you can demonstrate the ability for existing talent, that pipeline and the ability to recruit and then the business ecosystem. And it's different for every company. Some want supply chain companies. So we've done um, uh, data around especially some energy uh, opportunities where we're looking at supply chain uh, prospects within a 400 mile radius. It's very data intensive. And then we've got some that are a little smaller, but it is about, okay, so what are those salaries? What are their skill sets? How do we access that talent? Can we work with our colleges and universities to adjust the training um, for our needs? Um, and then how are we gonna scale that up and keep that going into the future? So, and it's all competitive because we're competing with other metropolitan areas or perhaps other countries for that timeline and the investment. It's all about um, cost, cost, avoid, cost avoidance, uh, risk reduction, and the ability to execute. So we talk about that all the time. It's one thing to have a plan, and it's one thing to say, if you come here, we'll do that. Uh, as we've uh, said in other settings, an if is a no, we have to be able to deliver, or it's not gonna happen. So we really focus on delivery and providing value when that company visits and being able to deliver. And I think uh, we've got a, uh, certainly a full pipeline. You saw the results last year, and we're seeing more and more opportunities and, and more delivery coming online. Thanks. All right, we're just about out of time. Uh, anybody else with a question? All right, I, I want to say that uh, it takes a, you know, a lot of organizations working together to kind of move something like this forward. And we have here the collection of these individuals and the organizations that they represent and the, the sectors of the economy that they represent. Uh, so I, I love to hear Matt talk about that there's really a lot of collaboration going on. You could add to this group NextCore for its uh, you know, entrepreneurship uh, approach and uh, Monroe Community College, et cetera. So um, pretty, pretty excited to see this, this kind of discussion. I think, to my knowledge, this is the first time that uh, the community has been exposed to all what must go into kind of creating a new industrial cluster. So thank you very much. Yep.